Hi, I'm Melanie Ann Phillips, co-creator of the Dramatica Theory of Story. And in this episode of Beyond Dramatica, I'm going to be starting a new mini-series looking at a concept that's so integral to the understanding and use of the Dramatica Theory that without it, Dramatica really couldn't work at all. In fact, this concept is so useful that it can be applied in other areas such as psychology and physics to help us understand patterns in the data that we're seeing. Well, what is this magical concept? It's called the quad. And to begin with, let's see how it's used in story structure and then see how we can apply it to some other areas as well. So to start, I'd like to take a look at the most extensive, complex, and, and detailed use of the quad in Dramatica theory, and that's here in the Dramatica structural chart. You see there are four towers, universe, physics, mind, and psychology. And collectively, they make a quad, a quad of four items. And you'll note that each one is subdivided at the second level down into four other items, forming a smaller quad. And each one of those items is divided into four, forming another quad. And finally, each one of those items is subdivided into four at the very bottom. So this chart is made up of a quad, of quads, of quads, of quads. They're wheels within wheels, or processes within processes. And they describe all the elements that you find in story structure and how they relate to one another by their position in all of these nested quads. Well, what if you take this chart and you flatten it all the way down, squish it down so it's all in one plane? You end up with a version of the chart that looks like this. In this version, you still see the four areas or families, universe, physics, mind, and psychology. And you can see, if you look closely, that they're still divided into those same four families each. And those families are divided into four subfamilies. And those are divided into four elements. It's just another way of looking at it. But here, you can see some of the relationships a little more clearly. And in the other form, you can see other kinds of relationships clearly. This is better to see the lateral form of relationship, like diagonals and horizontals. Whereas this one helps you understand the vertical relationships, such as how these two items relate here and how that compares to maybe these two items here. Well, I'm not saying what these items are or what they mean or how to use them. I'm talking about the framework itself, the quad, because where things are positioned in a quad has meaning. The reason that all of these items are here is partially because the items exist in story and partially because they need to fulfill different roles that are determined or predicted by the quad. Well, if you're not thoroughly confused yet, let me continue. First, what I'm going to do is draw the most simple quad I can and then explain some of these relationships in it and you'll begin to see why Dramatica is formed around it, or at least the Dramatica structure. Here's the most simple quad I can draw. It's just a square with four items in it. Well, actually, there are no real items in it. They're four placeholders. But it's not just a shelf or four cubby holes in which to place things. In fact, position is important in a quad. Why? Because here, you're going to find the things that are the most solid, the most refined down to a, a unit. Here you're going to find the forces of change. Here you're going to find the realm in which these two things affect each other. And here's how you're going to find that realm progresses over time. Sound a little complicated? Well, let's put four familiar words in there. The four dimensions of the physical universe. And those four dimensions are mass, and energy, and space, and time. Now it begins to make a little more sense. Over here, the things that are most solid, the massive items. Energy, the force of change, are things that move things around. This corner of the quad is always going to be the realm in which these things interact, which is, in this case, energy and mass interacting with one another in space. And finally, how that situation changes as it progresses, or in other words, time. So this quad actually represents, at one level or in one understanding, the four dimensions of our universe and how they relate to one another. Mass, energy, space, and time. And you'll notice that mass and energy are diagonal in here. That's because they have a special relationship called a dynamic relationship. And there's two of them in every quad, one this way, one that way. 
dynamic that way and a dynamic that way. Not frowning eyebrows, but the diagonals in the quad. And what does that mean? Does that have meaning? Well, any two items that fit the way they should in a quad are going to have this relationship where not only they can be applied to each other, but they can be transmuted one to another or morphed one to another, as it were. So you end up with mass and energy being able to not only be applied to each other like kinetic energy attached to a moving billiard ball, but also energy can become mass and mass can become energy, as in E equals mc squared. A small amount of mass can generate a lot of energy. And if you get together a lot of energy, you could from it create a small piece of mass. Okay, so that relationship that not only is can be acted upon each other, but also can be transmuted from one to another is a dynamic relationship. And the other dynamic relationship, space and time, that's where you end up with a space-time continuum. That's why it's a continuum, because they really relate to one another. It's really almost like a oh, I don't know, a spectral scale where you go from one color all the way to the end of the scale to the other. Space and time affect each other in a sense of relativity. For example, not only do you see items in space rearranging themselves over time at the basic level, which is like energy moving mass around billiard balls being knocked around, but also space and time affect one another relativistically so that the faster you go, which is speed, which is space and time, the more time appears to slow down for you and uh, the more for everyone else they appear to speed up. So that basically you can go into space and by the time you come back after traveling near the speed of light, you will have hardly aged and those outside will have aged considerably if not died and gone through several generations depending on how long you stay at that speed. Well. Looking at that gives us a rough idea of what a quad does and how it organizes. But there are also relationships we'll talk about later. The relationships this way, which are called companion relationships, and this way, called dependent relationships, which every quad has, and also two other special relationships, which we won't even get into now. That's for another one of these episodes. But to give you a, a better idea, a little more solid idea of how this is working, let's draw a second quad. And let's look at the four dimensions of the mind. Instead of mass and energy and space and time, we're going to have knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. And again, they fit in certain places in the quad because they have the same relationships inside the mind that these items have outside the mind. And why is that? Because our mind exists in a brain that exists in the four-dimensional universe. And as a result, as a harmonic of that, we organize our thoughts best in these four dimensions. That's why we see the four dimensions of mass and energy, space and time, is because our brains exist in a universe that has four dimensions. Similarly, when we turn that same insight we have towards ourselves, truly insight, we see four dimensions as well. Knowledge is the mass of the mind. It is the particles, components, or elemental substance of the mind that is the least likely to change quickly. Energy. Thought is the energy of the mind. And it has the same relationship to knowledge that energy has to mass in the outside universe. For example, you can rearrange bits of knowledge with thought like you can rearrange bits of mass with energy to build something. So you can build a complex form of knowledge just like you can build a complex framework of, of mass by using energy, by using thought to rearrange bits of knowledge and bring them into conjunction. Similarly, you can use energy to break up mass into smaller pieces, and you can use thought to break up knowledge into tinier chunks, which is kind of what you see when you look at this chart getting into smaller and smaller families. We're breaking up knowledge or material or substance or objective pieces into tinier pieces. Similarly, just as mass and energy can transmute in terms of E equals mc squared, a little bit of knowledge can generate an awful lot of thought, but it takes a lot of thought to arrive at a true bit of knowledge. So in fact, the relationship between mass and energy and knowledge and thought is identical dynamically. One looks at the dimensions of the ex external world, one looks at the dimensions of the internal world. And so, you can begin to see that this area always is the most massive or knowledge-like uh, item. Because we put it in the upper left, 
of the dramatic chart, and because we're in a Western society where the upper left has the predominance, this is a K-based society in which we live. In other words, knowledge is king. And so we put knowledge at that point, and for consistency so that the dramaticus structure does not have a bias to it other than that bias of choosing that the upper left will always be knowledge, that's why you end up with universe and physics and mind and psychology in this chart in that position. Universe is the most massive of the four items it is talking about the fixed external situation in stories. Mind is the energy. That is the attitudes that rearrange our universe. And if you put a lot of energy into your mindset, you may actually be able to affect some of the things in your world by applying your intent to do so. Similarly, universe and mind affect one another. A small bit of substance, substance can really change your attitude. But it takes a lot of attitude changing to get something to actually happen over here, or to even see it differently. Similarly, physics and psychology have that same kind of relationship of, of space and time. Oh, sorry, I did it again because I'm looking at the screen. Physics and psychology is space and time. Physics is talking about the way things are arranged together, the processes that are going on within universe. And psychology is talking about the processes that are going on within mind. Once again over here, we talked about knowledge and thought, but I hadn't yet talked about ability and desire. What do ability and desire have to do with space and time? Well, knowledge, if you look at ability, what's the truest real way of measuring ability? It's to compare what you know to what you don't know, minus k, or k prime if you wanted to. What you know to what you don't know. In other words, how much open space is there and where, how much of it is filled by your knowledge. In other words, how much is there to know and what fraction of it do you actually know? And so when you take pieces of mass and spread them around compared to the space that could hold mass, one mass can't be in the same place at the same time, so it can't occupy the same space, and so there's a maximum amount of mass you could have in space in a closed system. Similarly, in a closed mind, which is our own heads, they only have a certain size, there's a mass of, uh, maximum amount that we cannot know because our minds just can't see things any deeper than that. So we can tell when we look at any situation and say, how big is that black hole in our, our knowledge, in our, what we know? Well, how much we know of it and how much we don't know, the difference between the two determines our ability. And so ability functions the same way as space functions and it holds. Ability is the holder for knowledge and thought. Desire is very much like time. And why? Because desire depends on measuring what was to what is to what might be. We have to do a comparison until we see we might possess that or we might become like this or we used to have this or people used to treat us that way until we look at the way things were and the way things might be compared to the way they are, we get no sense of desire. It's an element of time within the mind. And just as space and time have a continuum, ability and desire have a continuum. In fact, ability and desire combine like a space-time continuum to form desirability, a blending. Desirability is what determines whether something is worth doing or not. If ability is zero, it doesn't matter how much desire we have, we won't act because we know we can't do anything. If desire is zero, it doesn't matter how much ability we have, we won't act because we don't want to. But if there's more than a zero value of desire and more than a zero value of ability, the combination of desirability means that we will act. And so this then becomes the modulator, desirability, as to where we're going to apply our knowledge and our thought. What is most desirable will get our attention, and what's less desirable won't. Similarly, in terms of mass and energy, where we mass and energy are relating depends on space and time. The warping of space and time determines where mass and energy will be applying what they do and how fast they will be doing it, for example. Well, that's all the time for this segment. We'll come back next time in the second part of the mini-series exploring the quad.